We're talking about visions and dreams, and one of the reasons we're doing that is because we're dreaming now of what kind of church God wants us to be. We have a vision, we have a plan, but we also want to expand our understanding. And so over here we have our dream tree, and dangling from that dream tree are all these different origami, and we have dreams of of what the church will be like in five years, what the church might be like 50 years in the future, of what the church can be like for the kids of our church. And, And last weekend it was really interesting because our dream was about marriage. And we dreamed about what marriages could be like, what our church could impact with marriage. And if you got a bulletin, this is the resulting word cloud from all of those dreams. And I, I was kind of surprised because, uh, you know, in the Saturday night service, there were a lot of people who put a lot of stuff up there. I was writing, other people were writing. And then on Sunday, especially 11, 15, I was the only one there writing. And I'm thinking, what's the matter? Nobody has any dream, or maybe I should say nobody has any hope for their marriage, or nobody thinks a church can have an impact in their marriage. And, and then when this dream cloud came out, Man, usually there's like dozens of words, and and then there's only a few words up here. But then I heard something really interesting. It is true that we had less responses, but it's also true that the responses were very, 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 very much more similar. And I think that's kind of interesting to understand that most of us have a pretty good idea how a church should impact marriages. And since we can pretty much agree on how they should impact marriages, we need to make sure that we dream of that and not just dream of it, we move in that direction. How it can impact our own marriages and how it can impact other people's marriages. I I understand that a lot of the dreams were present time oriented and my dreams were largely future. I dream of what our community would be like if we had multiple generations of godly marriages and the impact that would have on people's lives. But anyway, we did start the marriage course last Thursday, and we'll have another one, a repeat of the marriage course starting up. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. But today we're going to move on to our next dream. We're going to be talking about the dream that happens to the Apostle Peter. Now, uh, Pastor Tears and I kind of did this together, and and she kind of took the lead way with that, because my, my title for this sermon is very spiritual. It says, Peter, a dream of God's extravagant grace. And Pastor Tears' title is Peter, Pork and Preaching the Gospel. Uh, She's downstairs preaching this sermon in the teens. I'm up here preaching it. I will preach it at 9.15 and then at 9.30, no, at 9.30 tomorrow and then at 11.15 tomorrow, Pastor Tears will preach it up here and I will preach it to the teenagers. So you guys, you know, uh, be sympathetic with me. I'm going to have to try and change my cadence and change my delivery and everything else like that as we get ready to go. But why are we doing this? What are we talking about? Obviously, we are at a a pivot point in our church where we are moving direction in terms of location and everything else like that, moving methodologies because up until now, for the last 18 years, we've rented a place and now we're talking about owning a place. But also, we want to make sure that none of us become so satisfied with what we're doing as a church and what we are as a church that we forget that God has a purpose for us as a church. It's not just our individual purposes, but God's purpose for us as a church. And so we're looking at the different stories in the Bible where God gave a dream to somebody. Now, this particular dream that we're going to be looking at today as we move into the New Testament is a dream that came to the Apostle Peter. It's important for us to understand that dreams and visions all throughout Scripture are considered to be a gift with God. God speaks to us many different ways, but one of the ways that he speaks to us are dreams and visions. In fact, according to the book of Joel, chapter 28 and chapter 29, it's a clear sign that we have reached the final phase of God's working in history. The, apostle Joel, or the prophet Joel said this, then after, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And on those days, I will pour out my spirit on all servants, men and women alike. Now, on the day of Pentecost, Peter spoke and he told us these are the days that we live in. The days when God's spirit is poured out on everybody. Not a select prophet, not on an occasional priest, not on a random king, because certainly not all kings were anointed by God. But all of God's people can come. In this particular story, it's a story about a vision that was given to two men who couldn't have been much more different. One man is a Roman centurion, and one man is a Galilean fisherman. The Roman centurion is a guy named Cornelius. Now let's understand who he is. As a Roman centurion, he is an elite 
of the dominant army that has ruled the world already for a number of years, uh, at least the Mediterranean world, and will continue to dominate the world for a few more hundred years. As a centurion, he is an officer, roughly sp spoken, he has a hundred soldiers underneath him, but under a hundred soldiers, these so soldiers that he has, also there's a group of soldiers who will work with the soldiers and, and all the supply troops and all of the things like that. So he is an officer, of the most powerful fighting force. In addition, we learned something else about him. We learned that he's a God-fearer. Now, this is a really important concept when you read through the New Testament and, and the Gospels and the early letters, and this concept of a God-fearer. We find it several different times. What we have to understand is that the, the gods of the Romans, the gods of the Greeks, the gods of Asia Minor, the mystical religions and things like that, although they provided a religious framework for people, Although they give people something to believe in, it was not satisfactory to many people. The gods of the ancient world were not people that we were supposed to try and emulate their lifestyle. It wasn't aspirational. It wasn't an issue of, of moral value and moral purity. For the most part, they were like everybody else, only they were superpowered. They were corrupt. They were immoral. They were indecent. They cheated one another, and they did all those things. It reinforced in people's thought that this kind of randomness in the world. There's no sense of justice. People have a craving for fairness and justice and spirituality. And many of the people, including this Cornelius, this centurion, had learned about Yahweh, the God of the Jews, and his standard of morality and his standard of justice and his standard of doing the things that were right. And they placed their faith in him. But they were called God-fearers because they did not become Jews. They properly realize that belief and trust in God, although the Jews followed religious food orders and followed clothing orders and followed different kinds of rules, those rules were not of the same level of the moral rule, rules of don't lie and don't cheat and don't be unfaithful and don't covet. And they embraced the higher level laws without really wanting to be uh, become Jews. In order to become Jews, they had to follow dietary laws, they had to follow calendar laws, and especially for men, they had to be circumcised. And it was something that in the days before anesthetic, they weren't really, uh, you know, they weren't really interested in having done. Now, Peter is this other completely different person. He's a Galilean fisherman. He couldn't be much more different than a centurion. The centurion lives in Caesarea Maritime. Peter lives in Galilee. He's from Galilee. He's a fisherman. He's from, he's from the countryside. He has a distinctive Galilean accent. Wherever you live in most countries, if you live in the capital city, you can detect people who aren't from the city by the way they speak. And oftentimes you make fun of the country bumpkins that are around. And yet these two men both have a dream. And in this dream, God moves in amazing ways. The Gentiles considered the Jewish to be religious fanatics. The Jews looked down on the Gentiles as being not God's people and, and, and beneath them and unclean. And yet God is going to use a God-fearing Gentile and a lower class Galilean Jew to do something amazing. So let's stand to our feet. We're going to read one passage of scripture together and then I'll read something a little bit later to you. But let's read together. This is Acts chapter 10 verses one through seven. Let's read with enthusiasm. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that we would not only read this passage and have understanding of this passage, but we pray that the understanding would go beyond to penetrate our hearts 
so that you can speak to us as individuals and that you can speak to us as a church. Lord, we do believe that you have a, a plan and purpose for our lives. We do believe that you have a plan and purpose for this church. And, and your plan and, and your purpose is our dream. And so we want to look at these two dreamers and we want to ask how what happened to them impacts what you want to do in our lives. Help us, Father, in these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. The first thing that we see here is that God, in this amazing gesture of grace, reaches out to Cornelius, a Roman centurion, to enable Cornelius to hear the gospel. Other than God's intervention through a dream or through a, at least letting him meet this angel, Cornelius would have never had this opportunity. Now, we know what's going on in this particular situation. Cornelius is, is stored in this place. He's, 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 he's based in this place, and he has learned about Judaism. He's learned about God. And yet, this happens that God directly intervenes. God finds a man who, in his life, has made a decision to follow Yahweh, has begun to live a life of, of, that's pleasing to God, and he gives him this particular vision. Now, it's important for you and I to remember that God had made a promise long ago, and God is always faithful to keep his promises. And his promises included, in this meal story, incorporating Gentiles into his family. If we don't understand that the Jews very rightfully and, and very considerately thought of themselves as being different from everybody else, we can't understand what is powerful about this story. If we go back to Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, that amazing story where Abraham proves that his faith in God is absolutely complete because he's willing to sacrifice everything he has. And then it says, an angel of the Lord called to Abraham. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. So God makes this remarkable promise to Abraham. Abraham, I have called you, and you have responded. You have committed to me. You have followed me. And then God makes him these promises. And these promises include three important things. Number one, the promise includes that all the nations will be blessed through Abraham's people. Really important here. God calls Abraham. He says, your descendants will be my people. And then when the time of Moses comes along, in order to help these people to be separated from these different things, he gives them a list of different rules and he gives them a different list of things that they follow. And many of these things are moral lessons which teach them about right and wrong, but others are, are, are lessons about diet and lessons about other things. And, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But by the time this story takes place, the Jews of this area have become so different from all the people around them and have separated themselves to such a degree that there's no interaction between them. And now God is breaking down that barrier to remember with the promise that was given to Abraham, all the nations will be blessed because of your descendants. Now, this is really important. Don't miss this. It's not just that they are called by God. It is that God through them will call everybody. Do you, you understand the difference? It, it's not just that they are going to be his people, but by using him, God will make sure that everyone will be his people. So the first promise is this. All nations are going to be blessed through Abraham's family. The second promise is this. All of the Gentiles will be God's people. And then the third promise all of the Gentiles are going to be praising God. This is why he reached out through Cornelius. The time had come in God's plan when it was time to bust down all of these doors that had grown up between the, 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 the Israelites and the Jews and all of the people who were beyond because it was God's plan, just as Jesus said to his disciples, that this message will go to the end of the world. Now, let me read to you further, uh, Acts, verses 9 through 23. And this is where it gets really interesting, because this is where the second vision comes in. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. 
But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. On the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill them and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call anything unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Sitting outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said, I am the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, we're sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night, and the next day they went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. The second thing that we see here is God gave Peter an invitation in order to have Peter overcome his prejudice and preach the gospel to Cornelius' family. Now, it's important for us to note in this particular story that both, both Cornelius and Peter had personal prejudices that needed to be overcome. Both of them were separated from each other. Cornelius was separated from Peter by his position as a Roman, as a centurion, as an officer of an occupying uh, army. He was separated from Peter. Peter was separated from Cornelius by his own religious prejudices. He had never done anything unclean. He had never done anything that he was, never eaten anything he wasn't supposed to do. He didn't consider non-Jews as being people who could any way please God. And then he had this divine convincing come along. He had a vision of all these things, clean and unclean animals coming up. On this vision of this sheet from heaven, kind of like a tablecloth, I guess, he, the voice tells him to kill and eat, and he's appalled because he's never eaten anything unclean, and he's not about to start eating unclean. And then the voice says, don't regard as unclean what God has cleansed. And then the interesting thing happens. It doesn't happen once. It doesn't happen twice. It happens three times. Now, I was looking at that, and I was thinking, why does Peter have this thing with things happening three times? What is it about Peter's characteristic that makes things happen in three? Jesus told him, three times you'll deny me, and three times he denied him. On the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus said to Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter was like, why do you have to keep asking three times? But was he cured? No, because when he had his dream, three different times he saw the same thing. Now let's stop here for a minute and ask ourselves a question. Why food rules? Why what we would now call today the kosher rules? Why did God give them? They, they didn't make them up. They were given to them by God. What was the purpose of these things? Well, there are a lot of people who have a lot of different perspectives on this, and, and I want to share with you what I think are, to me, the most maybe three most obvious, I'll do three in honor of Peter, uh, the three most obvious reasons that we would see that God had given them dietary laws. First of all, it marks them as separate from the people all around them. You see, the people all around them could eat anything and everything that they could get their hands on. Now, I, I learned when I lived in Hong Kong that, that they, they used to say that the Chinese people eat every animal that's back faces the sky. And, and the, the, the standard line for that is every animal's back faces the sky except for humans. And, and, and so that, that's a culture and a society where everything is edible. Well, in most cultures, in most places, in most societies, everything is edible. But the Israelites, God's people, did not eat certain things. In fact, there were a number of certain things that they didn't eat. Why did God do that? I firmly believe that one of the reasons was because it was boundary markers. God wanted them to be different than the people that were around them. You might say, well, why do you have to be different from the people who are around you? Well, there are a number of reasons for them, but one is because God has called you, and he has asked you to be different. We all recognize that we have expectations of people in our lives, and the expectations of the people who belong to us, 
who are our loved ones, who are our spouses, who are our family members, are different from the expectations that we have of other people. I don't know if you've ever said it as a parent. I probably can't use this illustration downstairs, though maybe they'll understand it better when I'm talking to the teenagers. But many, many different times, my wife and I have been talking to our daughter when she's a teenager, and she would say, well, so-and-so can do that. And we would say, well, that's fine for so-and-so. She's not our daughter. He's not our son, but you're our son, you're our daughter, and you're going to behave this way. And that's, one, I believe, one of the reasons that God did it. Another, I think there's some really, really good uh, uh, biblical material to suggest that some of these boundary markers especially involve things that the Canaanites had worshipped. And the Canaanites worshipped certain animals, and so the Jews were supposed to stay away from those things because it was creating a line between them and the people that surrounded them all. And it, and it brings me to my final belief that I think is really important, and that has to do with the issues of sacrifice of animals and then the meal of the sacrifice being consumed as an act of worship. You and I, in our modern day, that's not really a part of worship. You don't say, oh, let's go to church together. Let's worship the Lord by eating burgers, you know, or let's go to church together. Let's worship the Lord. We'll take a turkey and we'll kill it and we'll cook it and we'll eat it together. And that's how we worship the Lord. And, and we will do that together, by the way, uh, Saturday before the anniversary. So the first Saturday of November, we'll worship the Lord by eating together. But we only do that once a year. But, but you've got to understand that in almost every religion in the ancient Mediterranean world, Part of an act of worship was to consume a sacrifice in the temple of the God that you were worshiping. Now, like I said, you, you may not relate to that, but that's exactly what was involved. And I, I, am, I am firmly convinced that the dietary laws of the Jews had a, had a very important basis in the fact that they didn't eat those things. They only ate the things that they had prepared themselves because they didn't want to consume anything that had been involved in sacrifices and worshiping other, other kinds of gods. Uh, you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the story of Daniel and how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been brought into the land of, of where the Babylonians were. And they had been told that they have to eat the food from the king's table. And they refused. And some people take that to mean that they didn't want the meat and the wine from the king's tables because it was meat and they were just going to eat simple vegetables. No, the issue there is not vegetarian or non-vegetarian. The issue there is all of the food that's at the king's table would have been prepared in the presence of idols. And they were not going to take place in anything or participate in anything that was involved in worshiping other idols. So when you hear about these food rules that God has given his people, remember, it was an act of worship for them to eat what God had prepared for them. Don't, don't lose sight of that. Now, unfortunately, they had taken it much further than God ever intended. But at this particular time, God is expanding the kingdom. N.T. Wright says this, and I love this quote, family eat together. That's probably why God gave Peter a food vision. The people you sit down and eat with are family. But the Jewish family has been called by God to be a separate group of people, to bear witness to his special love and grace in the world. And they must not compromise with the world. Now what God is saying in this particular story is, Peter, this rule about food was determined and given to make us to be one family together, to separate us from those people who would eat anything. We share this meal together. But now the time has come to break down those barriers and to include everyone. You see, Peter needs to understand that God's choice of Israel was an act of grace and not an act of partiality. And it called for a response of obedience. Now, this is important. Almost every time, I, I, especially the first 10 or so years I was in Indonesia, somebody would ask me every Q&A, why were the Israelites God's chosen people? What made them special? And the answer is, nothing made them special. Being called God's people was an act of grace. It was not an act of partiality. And he chose them to work through them because of Abraham's obedience. Now, if we were understand this, that being chosen by God is an act of grace, then we will also understand that election by God is about grace begetting 
grace, not about exclusivity. So yeah, why me? I look at my own life. Well, why was I born into a Christian family? Why, why was I born to, to parents who love the Lord, to grandparents who love the Lord, to uncles and aunts who love the Lord, to generations of ministers in my family? On my mother's side of the family, we can trace back. We had family who were ministers back in the 1500s. On my mother's side of the German side of my mother's family, we had, we had ministers who left the church with the Protestant Reformation. We had ministers who left the, the Lutheran church with the Methodist move. We had ministers who left the mess of this church when the Pentecostal message came along. We were people who left churches a lot. But the point is, why? Why did I get that? And does that give me the privilege of saying, wow, I must be really special to God? Or does that require me to say, God helped me to be able to understand his grace maybe a little bit more easily than people who grew up in doubt and fear. Therefore, I have that much more responsibility to share it with other people. Election, this idea or this truth that God has called each and every one of us. He has called each and every one of us. We understand as as Pentecostals and IES, we understand election differently than other people understand it, but we all understand that he has called all of us. But this response to this is not about being exclusive. It's about using the grace of God to be transformed and moved out of our lives into other people's lives. Because, first of all, because God has forgiven us, we must forgive others. How many of you are doing soap and read Matthew 6, or or reading through the devotional, read Matthew 6 this week? Oh, man, I shouldn't have made you guys raise your hand. I'm so discouraged. Isn't it amazing? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God's grace has, been, has allowed us to be forgiven. Therefore, we must forgive others. And because God has forgiven us and made us his children, we need to always be including others in God's family. It's not just for us. Finally, God's divine approval came in the form of the Holy Spirit being poured out over Cornelius' family. The Bible tells us in in, in Acts chapter 11, verse 17, it says, Peter wasn't even done preaching, and the Holy Spirit came. The Gentiles there stood to speak in tongues and praising God, which astonished the Jewish believers with Peter. That was the trump card. I'm sure this must be the message. After that, Peter didn't have a choice but to follow He asked if there was water so these people could be baptized. Later on, he said, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Note the role of the Holy Spirit here. The Holy Spirit sends an angel to speak to Cornelius. The Holy Spirit sends a vision to speak to Peter. The Holy Spirit brings the two of them together and right in the middle when Peter's preaching and, and doing the things that God th- he thinks God has sent him to do, the Holy Spirit is poured out on them and all of Cornelius and his crowd without having to join anything, without having to sign any certificates, without having to change their clothes, without having to do anything, they all begin to burst out speaking in tongues and praising God. Now why is that significant? Because we're Pentecostals? No, 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 that's not the reason. It's significant because that's what happened to the church and Peter remembered well on Acts chapter 2 on the day the church was born. And that's God's way of saying these people are part of the church also. God's Holy Spirit calls from one side. God's Holy Spirit calls from the other side. And God's Holy Spirit makes it clear with the message. You see, if we look back, the Holy Spirit just doesn't show up at the end of the whole thing. The Holy Spirit is involved in every aspect of the story. The vision to Cornelius, the vision to Peter, timing all everything's right so that the vision ended just as there was a knock on the door all the way. Remember, the Holy Spirit is in control, the Holy Spirit is strategic, and the Holy Spirit is intentional. All right. What does it mean to you and I? What's the message for us today? The first message is this. God desires for all people to be a part of his family, regardless of their cultural background or financial status. 
God desires all people to be a part of his family. Now here in IES, I got to be honest with you, I think that social status in IES is probably one of the hardest things for us to deal with. We are, we are not uh, racially homogenous in, I mean, in any way, shape, or form. We're all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds. But in this particular place that we are, the ability to listen and speak and understand in English carries a, so, a kind of a social level. Just simply because this, is a, this was a Dutch colony. If this had been an English colony and everybody had learned English, English wouldn't mean anything. But it does mean something here. And this is a problem. It's social status that is probably one of the hardest things for us to deal with. I got, I got permission from Pastor Oyen to tell you this illustration. I, I want you to understand it, okay? So I, I want to make sure I say this one right. In the earliest days of IES, we had a group called the YAF, the Young Adult Fellowship. And the YAF were just a rocking crowd. They met on Saturdays and they had a great, was it Saturdays, yeah, wasn't it? They had a great time together in the afternoon on Saturdays. And then one of the things that happened was that they would, a lot of them would go out together afterwards. And a problem came up, all right? Because this is an open thing for young adults who are part of IES, a lot of people came. And then when they would go out afterwards, everybody would be invited, and then they'd say, where are we going to go? And somebody would say, let's go to la 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 la. I don't, I don't know the names anyway. And they would go. Off they would go. Now this creates a problem. Because sometimes they would go to places that not everybody could afford. All right, now listen to me carefully. Don't misunderstand. That's not one problem. That's two problems. And you might be surprised what the second problem is. It begins to be a little sensitive. Some people begin to talk. Some people begin to grumble. Two issues here. Number one, okay? Let me say this carefully. Number one, people who, had, who could afford to go to certain places weren't sensitive enough to understand that not everybody could afford to go there. That's very true. Okay? Problem number one. Problem number two. People who couldn't go to the places that some people go were really sensitive about other people being able to go places they weren't able to go. Do you understand that? Problem number two is just as big of a problem as number one. Because what you've got is in a culture where everybody was together and having a wonderful time and hearing the preaching of the word and all worshiping together, praying for all these wonderful things going on, and then somebody, let's go over here. And the people who went, who picked the place to go, didn't understand that because they could afford it, not everybody could afford it. So there's a level of insensitivity there. I promise you, nobody said, ah, let's pick someplace expensive so that those guys can't go. I promise you that didn't happen. But it, they, they just didn't understand. Okay, that is a problem, but it is equally a problem. It is as much of a problem for somebody to say, oh, I can't afford to go there. What's wrong with you guys? Do you understand me? Do you, do you get it? I, it's too dark. I can't see the rest of you nodding your head. Don't expect me to hear it rattle all the way up here, yeah? Do you, you understand? If we're going to make it work as a church, we've got to be able to say, well, that's more expensive than I can afford. I hope they have a great time. So what? We are not expecting people to be homogenous. We're not expecting people to be the same. We're not expecting everybody to have the same background, the same culture, the same education, the same wealth, the same social status. We're expecting everybody to accept each other in spite of those things. And it's just as wrong for somebody to look down on somebody for what they don't have as it is for somebody to look down on somebody for what they do have. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of greedy people in the world, and some of the greedy people are rich, but some of the greedy people are poor. There are a lot of selfish people in the world, and some of the selfish people are rich, but some of the selfish people are poor. There are a lot of people who don't like other people because they're a different ethnic group. And some of them are from privileged ethnic groups, and some of them are from underprivileged ethnic groups. It doesn't make it right any direction. Got me? All right. Whew. I asked Oyen's permission. I didn't ask y'all's permission. I think somebody's going to shoot me up here. You understand, as a church, we've got to understand that God wants everybody in IES to be a part of IES regardless of their financial background, their cultural background, their social background, their educational background. We make everybody here. That doesn't mean that we all have to be the same. 
doesn't mean we all have to go to vacation the same thing. It means that you can't look down on me because I can't afford your vacation, and I can't look down on you, you because you can afford a nicer vacation. We're just happy that we get to have vacations. Amen. All right, good. Thank you, P. Mike. G second thing. God invites his people to overcome barriers that hindered them from preaching the gospel to everyone. What are the barriers that you and I face in our personal lives? What are the people that it makes it hard for us to, to preach the gospel? Are we, are we confronted by barriers of race? Are there certain kinds of people we find it hard to witness to? Are there certain kinds of people we find it hard to, to share about Jesus? Are there certain kinds of people we find it difficult to make, to talk to? Or is, it, it, is it an issue of culture? Is it an issue of nationality? Is it an issue of hygiene? We want everybody to come know Jesus except the smelly ones? It reminds me of a well-said question. When we look at people and we have a barrier to bringing them to Christ, we need to ask ourselves this question. How do I look to you, God? Because if we have a hard time with other people because of their race or their culture or their nationality or their background or their hygiene or their handicaps, how do we look to God? And yet he calls us all. And again, the Holy Spirit enables and powers God's people to be obedient to his call to love others. This is what the Holy Spirit is calling us as individuals to be. By his strength and by his power, you know, when I, bened, when I pray a benediction over you every week, I pray the same thing. Let the Holy Spirit empower you so that you can do the things that he's called you to do. And it's not automatic, but it happens as you yield yourself. Lord, help me to break down these barriers. And then let's go over here real quickly. That's what it means to us as individuals. What does it mean to us as a church? It means, first of all, that as a church, we should be a place where everyone, no matter their background, will be welcome as family. A family, a sense of belonging. You know, family is not just about being relatives. Gordon Fee talks about how there are only two places in the world where we have to love people without picking them. You pick your friends, you pick your spouse, you pick the people you work with because you don't work there if you don't like the people there. You, in, in life, you pick all these people. The only place where you don't get to pick who you're there with is in your family and in your church. You're born into a family, and whether you, whether you like them or not, you love them. And you're brought into a church, and whether you like them or not, you love them because they're also your brothers and sisters. One of the things that we talk about as we live in our life groups and our soap groups and our ministry groups is what we call EGRs. For those of you in an IES, you know what an EGR, EGR stands for extra grace required. And any of you who have ever been in a small group of any kind, you know that there's one person in the group that just kind of like God really put them there to help you be more graceful. And there's two rules about EGRs. Number one, if you look at your group and you say, oh, there's no EGR person in our group. That probably means it's probably you. Yeah, it probably means it's probably you. The second rule is this. You need to be thankful for the EGR in your group because the fact that you identified them so closely means you're candidate number two, and if they left, everybody would be pointing at you. Every group has an EGR, but that's the whole point. It is within the group, no matter who we are, no matter all those things, everyone being welcome, that God shapes us and forms us. Secondly, IES has to be a church that intentionally reaches out to the people who need to hear the good news. I, I, I put this as a quote from Tirza. It's, it's there as a quote from Tirza in your worksheet. It says this, missions isn't just a department or a program. It's more than serve the city involvements once a year. It's more than just making ourselves feel good about having helped a bunch of forgettable people. Wow, that's really good. As a church, we have to be reaching out because it's grace that's been given to us and grace begets grace. Election, God chose me, God chose you, God chose all of us. He invited all of us by his spirit and we were the ones that were privileged enough to say yes to the invitation. 
But that election, that grace that was extended to us, it must reproduce itself in grace to be extended to others. We must be a church that values souls because everyone needs to know Jesus. It's urgent. And then finally, as a church, IES always needs to be obedient to the move of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit continually define and redefine how we love others. God has, God has poured out his extravagant grace on all of us. He has included all of us. And it's the same grace for everyone. All of us are only saved by a gracious God who overlooked everything. He overlooked so much in all of us. And that same grace must include everybody.